Welcome to our preview of Hellbringer, a card-driven roguelike inspired by games like Diablo. Thank you, Max Gauthier, for sending us a prototype copy of your game to check out. So Hellbringer is being designed by fellow Canadian Max Gauthier, who will be and will be published by his production company, The Additional Smash, after what he hopes will be a successful Kickstarter later this year. Now, Hellbringer is being designed primarily as a solo experience, but can be played with groups of up to four players. No, our prototype only went to three. Each game of Hellbringer lasts at most two hours, but potentially much less if you die early in the game. Before we go further, I do want to stress that the copy of Hellbringer we played was still a prototype. Art was not finalized, design elements may change, and most importantly, the rules are still being tweaked and modified. This is a preview, not a review, and anything we talk about here could change before the final game is released. Now, Hellbringer is a card-driven dungeon-crawling game where you choose a character and then progress through four levels of a dungeon, from the crypt to the tomb of the demon. On your trip ever deeper, you will encounter monsters, find much-needed equipment, learn new skills, and level up your character. Combat features a unique line of sight mechanism that represents the dungeon getting darker as you go deeper. Can you defeat the demon at the bottom of the dungeon, or will you be overcome by them and their minions? Since the copy of Hellbringer we were sent is still a prototype, we didn't record our usual unboxing video. But I will say physically, everything was looking pretty good. Yeah, I agreed. Uh, the card design, the iconography, the artwork we did get to see, some was finalized, some wasn't, all looked good. Uh, while many of the cards did note the art wasn't finished, the ones that were I liked what I saw. The boards included were functional, and I particular excuse me, and I particularly liked the dry erase portion of the player boards, where you actually track your character stats while playing. The boards were of a jigsaw fit type, and they did what they needed to do with places for the decks and cards that were needed. Now, where things did fall apart a bit is with the rule book and the included campaign book. Now, physically, they looked pretty good. They were well laid out, lots of white space. There were examples, and there were some other solid design elements. But sadly, the translation of these rules did leave a lot to be desired. Yeah, not only the translation, but the organization of the topics lacked a lot. Uh, lacked a lot. Uh, combined with the uh, with no index, there was a lot of page yeah. flipping to try and grasp the rules or find a clarification when we did ran, run into something we either missed or, or had forgotten from the rules. Yeah, it was one of those rule books where you're like, I know it's in here somewhere, where is it? And we did have an issue with that. Now, I don't want to harp on these rules too much because at this point, the game's still in development. And I do have to thank Max for being very accessible during all of our plays of Hellbringer. He had an answer for all of our questions, which was great. And with his help, we were able to figure out and play Hellbringer successfully. <laughs> Speaking of figuring out how to play, how about we move on to that? Why don't you summarize how to play Hellbringer? Well, you start by building the dungeon deck. This involves taking all of the core cards. It's a significant chunk of cards, shuffling them and creating four decks. To each of these decks, you're going to shuffle in a number of combat cards based on the number of players and a story card. You're then going to shuffle them all, put a location card at the bottom of each of the deck, and then stack them so that you're progressing through the different levels, the crypt, followed by the cave, then hell, and then finally, the demon's tomb. This not only gives you the flow of play, but a large tail of cards to support you, even if it takes you a while to fight that last enemy. I got to see that in person the other day. Now, the monster deck is built next, which involves shuffling the two monster decks separately, the starter monsters and the main monsters, and then putting a set number of random beginner monsters on top of the standard ones, again, based on the number of players. They make sure to put some easier creatures on top based on the player count to ease you into the dungeon. Mm -hmm. Next, you're going to pick a scenario to play. Uh, every scenario features two sets of rules. There's like a normal mode and a difficult mode where... As far as I could tell, all of the normal modes were the same. It was pick any character you want, and the only thing that would change is which demon you're going to fight at the end. All the heroes are able to use, and that's it. Now, the thing that does change, though, is the story on the different missions. As well, at the more difficult level, the choice of characters could be restricted, and there will always be special rules, which tend to be triggered by the story cards, like adding more damage dice to the opponents or players losing skills as they delve deeper and so on. Now, the game currently includes nine scenarios and a tutorial. 
Now, the tutorial is just something to learn the game that uses a smaller deck with only two locations in it. Now, the straightforward deck builds here really do make this game quick to get mm -hmm. up and playing with, no matter what level, scenario, or player count you want to use. Now, everyone then picks a character to play, of which there are six to choose. You've got warrior, hunter, paladin, druid, monk, and sorcerer, pretty typical fantasy character classes. You're going to take the starting card for that character and add them to a starting hand of four cards drawn from the bottom of the dungeon deck. Again, you're not delving the dungeon yet. You're just getting them from the core cards. Now, the card for the character is placed on your player board, and the bottom of the board is filled out with your character's starting stats. Again, this is done with dry erase, because the marker, the, the stats here are going to change a lot. Now, the stats in Hellbringer are health, armor, vision, action points, skill, and end limit. There is also a chance for one of the players to trade in a card from those starting four for a healing potion to start mm -hmm. with, but only one for the whole table. This is a good plan for multiplayer games. <laughs> yes. Now, once everyone has their characters ready, you're going to read off the campaign book for the first location, and you're going to read the tome card. These are both actually, sorry, the location card and the tome card, and the location card is going to tell you to read the campaign book. Both that location card and that first tome card are on the pre-printed on the board. Now, the first location is the graveyard. It's going to have you reveal a number of monsters equal to the number of players plus one. Then the tome card tells you to read your background information. Then you're ready for the first player's turn. Now, when you first start, you won't have much to do. Most players are only getting one action as a default. Now, on your turn, you can take a number of actions equal to your action points. These actions include attacking monsters in play, using an ability on a card, learning new skills, assigning a companion to your character, equipping items, enchanting those items, using potions, using uh, defense cards, and trading cards. No, trading cards only happens in co-op play, which kind of makes sense. Now, each card in the game shows how many actions they take to use. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail of all the different card types and the timing and how that all works, but I do want to call it a couple things that I think stick out in this game. So equipment cards are placed on your player board where you have four specific slots that are color-coded. Each piece of equipment will have to match the slot, and there are some equipment pieces that'll take up more than one slot. These tend to be two-handed weapons. Now, pretty much every piece of equipment is going to modify your basic stats. Weapons will also give you attack options. Now, as noted earlier, all the improvements are tracked by dry erase at the bottom of your board, so you equip the card and then update your stats. Note, there are also items that improve other players' stats yep. in co-op play. So keeping a close track is important, as in a group game especially, it would be really hard to go backwards and figure out what your stats should be if you had messed up along the way. Yes, one of the things you will have to remember is if you lose any of these cards, you're then going to have to adjust again, probably putting things back down. Now, skill cards work a little differently from those. So many of the skill cards are related to one of the six classes in the game. Well, anyone playing can use any skill once. Using a skill that matches your class lets you keep it in play. Besides your player boards, so you can use it again and again. And that's part of the tableau aspect, tableau building aspect of the game. Now, your skill stat determines how many of these skills you can have and play at once, with characters like the Sorcerer getting way more than, say, the Warrior. And just because you've learned a spell doesn't mean you don't still have to pay to use it. Right, but it's there to be used over and over again. Now, each character also has one slot to hold a companion. These you only have to pay for once, and then once they're in play, they're going to do their action every round for free. Now, one character class, the Druid, is an exception to this rule, but if you follow the rules clearly printed on the cards, it's easy to see how they can have more companions. Now, Hellbringer has a very unique combat system, which starts out with the pretty cool line of sight rules. Now, every character has a sight stat and every monster has a visibility stat. A character can only attack monsters in their sight if the sight stat beats, meets or beats the mob's visibility. Now, the central board is used to track this and it's divided into three areas to make this easier. If you're playing with uh, multiple players, especially you've got row for mobs visible for ev to everyone, mobs visible to at least one character and mobs no one can see. Now, in general, you can only attack monsters you can see, but some cards do make exceptions. Now, this is a bit more complex with multiple players, as some can see creatures in the middle and others can't. But in practice, it never actually confused us, as it's really easy to check out quickly. Yeah. Now, actual attacking is done by rolling a number of custom six-sided dice. These come in red, which feature fives, tens, and blanks, 
and green dice that feature fives and even more blanks. You pick a mob to attack and roll all your dice in one big pool. If the total on your dice meets or beats the target's health plus their armor, that mob is defeated. If not, nothing happens. This is important. Note, there's no tracking of hit points in this game. Every attack is all or nothing. You defeat your target or you don't. Now we understand this is going to be a red flag for a lot of players, mm. but given the game's origin as a solo play, it makes sense and really minimizes the bookkeeping required and keeps it as that quick, fast to play game. Yes, it definitely helps with the speed and, the, and the, there's less fiddliness, right? Now, of course, there's a few more things to take into account, like there's rules for combining different attacks to take down bigger monsters. Many of the monster skills and equipment cards modify this system. You're going to find things like attacks that ignore armor, skills that let you reroll dice, and so on. As well, thematically, the green dice are a poison attack, while the red dice are your physical attacks. Now, when you do kill your target, you get to take the card and use it to level up your character. There's a spot on the side of the board with slots for all of the game stats. So you slot a monster into any stat and it goes up. This is how you get more actions, more health, more armor, more skill slots, better vision, and so on. And trust me, you need to kill some things to have a chance to be able to kill more things. Now, thankfully, you can share your kills in multiplayer. So if yeah. one person is doing all the killing, they can give their kills to others to help level up everyone's stats. Which came into play a lot in our games. Now, once you've used all your actions, you then refill your hand with cards from the dungeon deck based on your card hand limit. This represents getting deeper into the dungeon. Now, most cards are just going to be added to your hand to be used the next round, but the deck also includes some of those other special cards we shuffled in when setting up, right? There's combat cards, which are going to spawn new monsters, story cards, which give all the characters some type of benefit and have you read the next section of the story, and location cards that represent reaching a new level of the dungeon which again are probably going to spend more monsters as well as make things more difficult for you. Now, the important thing to note here is that monster cards can be added due to drawing combat cards just before the monsters go. And players don't get to draw extra cards for their hands when drawing any of these special cards. So you may not end up with a full hand. Now, this is a game where cycling your deck and digging for cards is not what oh. you want to do. Your best chance is to maximize the cards you get to the best of your ability. No matter what you're getting, you get. If you can use it, you should try. Yeah. Now, once all characters have taken their actions, used up all their action points, the monsters go, what they do is determined by another custom D6. This will show you if the monsters attack your companions, if they attack you, if they attack you and your companions, or if they take up a defensive position. Now, the defensive position just causes you to discard two cards and there's no attack. Now, the mobs are attacking companions, and you don't have one, you get hit instead. Now, while it's nice to not get attacked once in a while, discarding two cards from your hand, as we were talking, can be devastating. Yes. Again, that deck is how deep you are. Every time you draw, you may be making things harder on yourself. Now, when the monsters attack, unlike the heroes, they don't worry about line of sight. Every round, every monster attacks using one giant dice pool. You just add them up for everything in play. Add up all the deck dice and the monsters, roll the big pile of them, and apply the results to everyone as indicated on the monster roll, or the monster action die. Now here again, it's all or nothing. The monster's total damage is higher than your combined health and armor, or your companion's combined health and armor, you're dead. That is, unless you have a defense card, like a potion or some other defensive skill. Now again, this takes a bit to get used to. Like, you're going to want to get hit for 60 and take 60 off your hit points, and that's not it. As long as you have a combined armor and health of 60, you're fine. There are no hit points in this game. Survive or die. There's nothing to track between combat rounds. It's all about planning, keeping an eye on what sort of maximum the enemy is going to be capable of yes. doing and have options to mitigate some of that damage or else. Now, if you do die in a solo game, that's it. Game over, man. But if you die in, this, in the cooperative game, you just flip your character card. You let the other players loot your stuff and then sit back and cheer them on, hoping for a resurrection card to come up. Uh, there are a few of these in this deck, not a lot, as well as a chance to resurrect everyone when you get to the fourth story card. So, no, this is one of the more problematic aspects of the game we found, as not only is it a player sitting back and not doing anything, except maybe helping roll the monsters, 
but you're also unable to advance. So you're very likely to be at a severe disadvantage when and if you do resurrect. Now the game continues on like this until you get to the last location card that'll have you reveal the demon. Now again, the demon set by the scenario that was chosen and will be a card for a particularly badass monster that's gonna take a lot of damage, do a lot of damage itself, and you're going to need to do all of that damage at once because, again, the all or nothing combat system, you've got to hit that 135 to take down the dragon in one hit. Now, if you do manage to kill this demon, no, you don't have to kill any of the minions in play. You could just focus on the demon. You win. Congratulations. Rebuild the dungeon deck, pick a different scenario, pick a different character, and delve again. I think that covers the basics of game playing without getting into too many details. Well, now let's start talking about what we thought of Hellbringer. Yeah, so I got to start by saying the prototype copy we got was a bit of a hot mess, and that's being polite. Uh, I would go so far as to say completely unplayable as written. Yeah, as noted earlier, thankfully, the designer was easy to reach and very forthcoming with clarifications and advice. Now, I also, before getting prepped for the weekend to play, found a pretty good actual play on the Hellbringer website. It's hellbringergame.com. And to be honest, that was the only reason we were able to even sit here and talk about the game. It was just with the box, we wouldn't have, we would have, a, if, if it had, all I had was that box and I sat down and we were having to tell you about it right now, this would be a much different preview. Yeah, I did uh, initially try to play with only the rule book, no videos or assistance from uh, the designer, and it was not a success. Now, with all this talking to the designer, the one thing that did become very clear as we were playing was this game is not done. It's still in the middle of the development process and still being play tested. Actually, we provided Max with so much feedback based on us trying to learn his game that our group's now going to be credited as official play testers on the game. Which is cool, but I think not quite what we were expecting when agreeing to preview this game. Yeah, I got to admit, this was a bit frustrating. Um, I much prefer, prefer reviewing completed games. And honestly, I really got to stop saying yes to these preview requests. Uh, the big takeaway, I think, though, that we all had with Hellbringer is that it shows a lot of promise. And having a designer that's willing to listen to feedback is going to be great for the final product. Now, while I hope this game is still a distance from being on Kickstarter, I do think it belongs there once yep. they nail down how to explain the game to strangers in English. Well... With that, let's move on to talking about what we think makes this game look so promising. And I want to start with the theme. So Hellbringer is meant to be a roguelike card game. And to me, it really does feel like a roguelike. And by roguelike, I mean rogue, like going back to the origin of the term. I played a ton of rogue back on the Amiga. Yes, we're old guys. Um, I played rogue. I, I played with the at and the dog walking with me. And I played many, many versions of rogue over the years. And the fact that every game you play builds a completely random dungeon that's just filled with some timing cards that progress the story and spawn monsters, it really gave me that old school, purely random dungeon delver feel. Things like the fact you could get a hugely powerful monster showing up early or something that has such high visibility that it won't be able to see it ever, yet it'll keep poking you every turn, following you around. Plus, there's always the fact you can end up with a super powerful skill or weapon in your starting hand just by chance. To me, those are staples of a good roguelike, and I enjoyed finding them in board game form. So this game is filled with random, and it is designed that way, which will, is, of course, turn off some players, True. but not, I think, the ones who are used to the experiences from, say, Slay the Spire and other even modern roguelikes, as well as, uh, you know, old folks like us. <laughs> now, the other thing I liked thematically was just how many monsters show up and will be defeated during the game. I really did get that feel, especially playing solo, of going after wave after wave of mobs trying to take me out, and there's that tension that one more mob adding one more die might be that one to take me out and I feel like I'm going to get overwhelmed. The physical nature of grabbing a larger and larger dice pool even adds to that. Yeah, and there are even times where you didn't want to kill that last monster because yeah. you know in attacking them, you may be spawning a whole new group of monsters that are going to do way worse than the one guy yes. in the back who's just pinging away and can't hurt you. 
And just like any good roguelike, sometimes it happens. You are overwhelmed. This is not an easy game, and you can be eliminated pretty early in this game. Now, that alone is going to be enough for some people to say, heck no, I'm not interested. But when playing solo, it just means reshuffle the cards and play again. But playing cooperative is where I find it's a bit of a problem. It can mean a lot of downtime, because when you die, you just sit there and watch everyone else play, hoping someone gets something that'll let you resurrect. And it was this that makes me think that it may not be an ideal three or more player game. It works, but the downtime is something we don't really like to see in modern games. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we found it could actually be a bit of an emotional drain to the excitement at the table. Uh, And that was and that was problematic. And as Sean said, even if you do eventually get that resurrection, you come back, you're so underpowered that you just die again, which was another issue. Now, what I liked even less is being alive in the game and having turns where you can't do anything. This was particularly a problem for my wife. Due to the random nature of the dungeon deck, it's very possible you could get a hand of cards you can't use. Either they have too high an action cost or you draw skills for the other classes. So in in playing cooperative, you want to give those away. So all I draw is a bunch of paladin skills. Well, it's way better if I give them to the paladin. And it leaves me with nothing to use on my own. Now, this is compounded by the fact that when you refill your hand, you don't get to replace those special cards you draw. So here I have a small hand at the end of my turn. I only have two cards left, and I draw two combat cards and a a story card. Well, I still only have two cards the next round. Plus, then there's the one action on the monster die that can come up and make you discard cards. Like, we had turns where players started their turn and they had no cards in their hands. And they couldn't see the monster, so their turn was, I do nothing, your turn. Yeah, you you can build a maximum hand size with skills of anything, but still have no cards. And if your attack count isn't high enough, it may be impossible for you to do any damage to the available monsters. Now, I do know lack of cards in hand is one of the things the designer is working on fixing. Actually, the latest version of the rules I took a quick look at before working on this review today, I see that now players will be drawing cards from the bottom of the deck when a special card comes up. But to be fair, those weren't in the rules when we played and for this preview. Uh, so it's it's a real problem. And actually, it seemed to become worse uh, the more you could do, is the more chances you were going to draw special cards that caused actions and left you short. So it will be interesting to see the new, uh, the new version. The new version, yeah. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is a combat system. We've already mentioned that this is going to be a flag for some people. This is going to be divisive mechanic for many groups. The whole all or nothing, roll a huge pull of dice, and you either defeat something or you don't, is nice and quick. Rolling huge piles of dice feels good. But I think a lot of RPG fans, especially pen and paper role-playing game fans, are going to hate the fact there's no tracking of hit points. There's no slow progression of damage and defeating something. I also feel some people are not going to like how armor works because armor in the game is just a number that gets added to your health to make you harder to kill, unless some card says ignores armor. While I recognize these mechanics from video games, I don't know any other tabletop game that uses them. Yeah, and I think it makes much more sense in its solo farm than it does in the group cooperative play. As three of you in each turn, each doing 120 points of damage, but with the armor, the monster has 130, so even though all three of you are slaying away at it, it lives on happily. Yeah, I will say the the rules as they stood for combining attacks were a little obtuse, they were a little hard to understand, and I didn't find a reason other than maybe it breaks the game for why you shouldn't be able to combine attacks from other characters. Like, maybe it just makes it too easy, but it it, rationally, it didn't make sense. So overall, as it stands right now, Hellbringer shows a lot of promise. The basic gameplay is engaging and fun. The mechanics work well together. And while we did hit a lot of stumbling blocks when trying to learn the game, those were all due to an incomplete and poorly translated set of rules. Both things that honestly shouldn't be a problem by the time any of you are able to pick this game up or back it on Kickstarter. We honestly found, all of us found, a lot to like in Hellbringer. And what I'm looking forward to is seeing how it improves and develops further. Because it's already good. How great can it be? For all the frustration and flaws, especially as that solo or two-player co-op game, I think it's got huge potential. If you're looking for an engaging solo dungeon crawl, 
you're going to want to keep your eyes op uh, open for Hellbringer. The game plays nice and quick solo, and I found that dying in solo just made me want to try again. It had that, oh, I was so close, I got to give it another try, which honestly to me is a perfect sweet spot for a cooperative game. Now, as for a cooperative dungeon crawler, Hellbringer is solid but not perfect. While the mechanics for trading cards and working together are pretty solid, there can be a lot of downtime, especially if a character ends up dying. And I really hope it's these aspects of the game that get a little playtest a little more, a little more developed and improved to see this become a more smooth, solid, cooperative experience. Now, where I do think this game may find a market that you might not expect is fantasy role-playing game fans looking for some way to enjoy a dungeon crawling experience without needing other players. While I wouldn't say this is a solo GM-less RPG, you're not going that far, but you do really get that beat up the monsters, level up your character and equip new equipment. Like to me, this seems like the perfect game for when you know, your D&D game gets canceled and you still kind of want that experience. And again, personally, the big thing I'm looking forward to is where's this gonna go? I know the game's improving. I know it's changed since we played it and every change I've seen looks better. It's already good, but has every opportunity to become great. So that's it for our preview of Hellbringer coming soon to Kickstarter. Now, if you're interested in a more detailed breakdown of how to play in the components in Hellbringer, you can check out my written preview over at tabletopbellhop.com. 